Thank you, Heather. Uh, kids are dismissed for Children's Church at this time, if their parents would like them to go. And uh, we get to, as they look at God's Word, we get to look at God's Word uh, together as well. And if you'd like to turn to Jeremiah 9, that'd probably be a good place to start, and we're going to be kind of jumping around, as you probably get used to when you know, preaching. It's hard when you preach once in a while, um, you pick a topic, and it tends to be in different uh, places that we've searched. Uh, I think you guys know, it's no surprise that Pastor Bill isn't here, that they're taking um, some time away, so that has been good for them, and opportunity to rest, and so I'm filling in for him this morning. And um, yeah, just have the opportunity to teach God's Word. So let's start this time with prayer. Um, as always, I need it, and you need it. Uh, God's help, so let's ask him. Dear God, I would thank you for the opportunity to gather together. In the relative scheme of the things, Lord, our, our community where we live, we are not a large number. Uh, but you have called us out, Lord, uh, by your grace uh, through your Son, Jesus, who you've opened our eyes. And, and you are at work in our lives, changing who we are. And so we, we want to give you praise, Lord. And we want to exalt your name. And we want to allow the songs that we were singing, Lord, to continue to reverberate through our hearts and our lives, Lord, and to grow and expand. Because this is, this is fitting for the type of God that we worship, the type of God that we come before in your presence. Lord, right now we're going to look at your word. And Lord, we are going to be blind deaf, hard-hearted people apart from you uh, working uh, to help us to see and to hear and to feel. And I'm going to be a pretty uh, mixed up, insufficient communicator, Lord, apart from you uh, guiding my heart and my words, Lord, to speak uh, what is true and what comes from you. So we ask that you would help us in this end. In Jesus' name, amen. So on the uh, corner of our property, as you're coming from the four-way there in the middle of town, we have a sign that has our church name on half of it. And on the other side of the sign is a statement that says, how many of you know? Learning God's Word together. I know, I had to really think about that because I knew that sign was there and I know I've passed it a lot of time. But as most of you, if you're like me, things that you pass by a lot, you tend to ignore after a while. You don't even see that it's there. Uh, you just, it, it, it's not a part of what you take notice of anymore. Thinking about that sign. I don't think that sign is just a meaningless slogan but I think it actually represents something that our church desires or intends to, to do and to be about. Uh, so think about it. Each week, uh, we have a Sunday school that follows this time here together, where we have classes for everybody of all ages to study the Bible, to look at it from the youngest on up to the oldest of us. And then uh, we have Awana on Wednesday night to help uh, children memorize and learn God's Word. We have time for memorization, time for them to uh, hear from God's Word being taught as Kevin teaches them. And then we have things like youth group for teenagers uh, to gather around uh, the Word on Sunday evening. We have time for the adults uh, to gather here on Sunday evening to study God's Word, to encourage one another, uh, to learn what God says to do. Uh, to do. Uh, we have small groups that are starting up. Small groups have gone before and started going on. And a, a significant component of those small groups are going to be gathered around the Word to kind of better understand what God has to say. So we, we do that. And then we do things throughout the year, uh, VBS and Youth Archery Camp, all, all these times where we're like really focused on, on trying to know what God has to say we, at, at all different levels. Sometimes we'll have special retreats for teens or ladies or guys that get together and again, we're like focusing on what God has to say. We, we, we want to know something about who God is. And then there's, of course, this time, in, in this, this morning. This is kind of like the 
primary time where we as a church come together and gather together to know what God says. Like this is significant. And, and out of this time where we gather together, we spend some time singing and praying and reading Scripture, but then we listen to what God has to say through His Word. In fact, even for, for most churches, uh, the primary leader of a church is called a preacher uh, or, or a teacher, uh, somebody who teaches. And, and for churches, they, they value that position quite, quite a bit. They, they want somebody who's going to be able to teach the, the word or like, like even if they're a great guy, all right, like that's really important to us. And we're not unique in that. There are many, many thousands and tens of thousands of churches that are like that. So, if these things are true, and we do all of these things, and learning God's Word together is not just a slogan, but something that we're really about, uh, why does that matter, and what is it leading us to? Why does it really matter? So, maybe to put it right, if you're for us right here, right now, why should I bother listening to Pastor Brandon this morning? Hey, maybe you've got a lot of stuff on your mind. You probably do. Your life is busy. Why not just let our minds wander their normal course? Why, why try to focus and pay attention uh, right here, right now? What, what does it really matter? Am I going to be that much better off? Or is it going to be that much different if I just do, do let my mind go its normal course? Or, or is there something that's happening as I'm learning uh, who God is and, and what He's called us uh, to? What does it lead us to? What, what's happening to us? What should be happening to us with all of these things that we are doing with learning God's Word, trying to know Him? What's it leading us to? So uh, this is not just an idle thing. This is something that God says that we should be about. So in Jeremiah chapter 9, uh, verse 23, this is the Lord speaking, of course, through uh Jeremiah, the prophet, thus says the Lord. Okay, so this isn't just thus says Jeremiah, thus says the Lord. What does the Lord say? Let not a wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. And let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. So God is saying that out of everything that you can do, every endeavor that you can be a part of, whether it's being smart or powerful or significant, here's what's really important above all of those things is that you would know God. That you would know God. About everything that you could spend your life doing. What God says is that you would know Him supersedes. It's far greater, better than any other thing that you can give your life to. And so that's uh, seen and observed in Paul's life. The Apostle Paul writing to the church in uh, Philippi and Philippians uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 10. He's talking about this desire that he has. The Apostle Paul has a very focused, intense desire that's driving him through his life. And verse 10 of Philippians 3 says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Uh, from the dead. Uh, he's saying that out of everything else, he's willing to lose everything. He's willing to count everything else in his life as a complete loss. He's willing to throw everything away in order that he may know God. Now, what gets a person there? Like, that is not a normal, normal, natural human inclination. We are way more concerned about a million other things than knowing God. Like our social media feed, 
what people think about us, how to make a million dollars, how to fix something. All of these things just like kind of overflow and come out of us. How to have a good time on Friday night. All of these things just kind of are our day-to-day where our focus and our intent is. And he's saying that I'm willing to throw away all of those things the greatest things that everybody else is sacrificing and working 10 and 12 hours a day to get to. He said, I'm willing to give all that away so that I may know God. What does Paul see? What does he have that, that just isn't normal or natural in most of us? We need to know God. But here's the challenge. Is that we are naturally, we are naturally ignorant of God. It's not, it's not even just that we're naturally ignorant of God. We're naturally indifferent. Like we really don't know a lot about God and we don't really care a lot about God on our own. In fact, I, I came across this really interesting thing. I got kind of lost in it, kind of searching it up. Like there's this thing, Google Trends. I don't know whether you guys have ever looked at it. So Google Trends, uh, Google, of course, is... Uh, is the most popular search engine, and it just kind of th- th- there's it, it highlights this human instinct that we have to know. All right, that's why Google is one of the most uh, wealth wealthiest companies in the world. Like it naturally is tapping into things that this human instinct that we want to know stuff. And we it's just fascinating. We Google uh, all kinds of stuff, but here's the interesting thing about this really, really powerful search engine is they keep track, and they can track out across the world, it's because a global company, what people are searching for, right? They, 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 they keep track of it, and like I know it presents all kinds of privacy concerns and things like that, but it's, it's very interesting to see what people are looking for. And I came across this one uh, site that I think aggregated, kind of put together some of uh, the, the the search uh, the searches that people are using uh, on Google, and it was the of the thousand most asked questions on Google. The thousand most asked questions. It's all over the place. It's, it's pr- really really fascinating, very interesting. All of the, this information that Google has. But as I'm going through, and I read, so this lets you know how I get sometimes when I get involved. Like I read all 1,000 of those questions to see what people are looking for. And out of all the thousand questions, there are not but five that have anything even remotely, remotely to do with God. Like I, I'm thinking of one, what is the meaning of life? That was around 100 or so. And, and, and uh, when was Jesus born? What's Good Friday? How to pray the rosary? Like I, I think those are the only things that are in the top thousand most searched increase on Google that people are going on. So we are naturally not really concerned about God, at least as reflected on what we look for on the internet. And so we need, we need God to, to reveal himself. Like, to kind of use that meme, one does just not know God. Okay? Do you understand our our status in relation to the God is, is much, much inferior. We are created in the image of God, but we have nothing of the capacity or the power or the authority or the ability of God. So that if there is any possibility for us to know God, He is going to have to initiate things. He's going to have to reveal Himself to us. And so God reveals, the good news is that He does, God reveals Himself that we might know who He is. And this is good that He does that because we need to know who God is. We need this. God reveals Himself. And so, uh, in 1 John uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 5, uh, God is light. God is light. God, this is the good thing about us for knowing God. That God is light. That's speaking to the aspect of God that He is truth. He is the source of truth. He is the measure of all that is true. God is light. So that in order to know who God is, this is going to lead us into what is true, not into what is false. And again, Jesus is really clear. So in in Matthew 13, 
where he gives this parable of the seed and the sower, and the, 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 the sower goes out and casts seed in some la lands on rocky soil, and some in the thorns, and some along the, the pathway, and some in good soil. And the disciples come to him and they ask him, what does this mean, Jesus? What are you talking about? We don't understand this. And Jesus says something really interesting in, in Matthew uh, 13. Uh, verses 14 and, and 15. He says that this, the way that he's communicating and teaching is actually fulfilling a prophecy of Isaiah, uh, which he said that you will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would be they would see with their eyes and they would hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and I would heal them. Jesus is saying that people are generally closed-eared, closed-blinded people who don't know or understand what God is communicating to them. That that is the, 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 the hazard, the problem that we encounter is that we don't hear God. We don't see Him. We don't understand what He's trying to say to us. Despite the fact that He's revealing Himself through creation. The heavens declare. Uh, the, 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 the earth, the firmament is showing the work of God. The, it's communicating to us and inside of us. We have our conscience that is directing us. Don't do that. No, don't go that way. That's not right. That's not good for you. We have within us this moral compass that's directing us to God. And yet we still have a hard time to hear God, to know God. And so we need somebody to tell us. We need somebody to tell us. And John 1.10, speaking of of uh, uh, Jesus. He was in the world. The world was made through Him. And the world did not know Him. Jesus comes to earth. He made the world. He, through His power, the world is being sustained. And everybody's walking by Him, not even knowing who He is. So he says, John, right, the Baptist, came to testify to who Jesus is. Someone came to Say, hey, look everybody, this is Jesus. He's the light of the world. Listen to what He says. Pay attention to Him. Then Jesus declares His message that I am the Son of God. I come to redeem you. And then we have the witnesses of His disciples pointing us back to Him. Hey everybody, look at Jesus. He's the light of the world. Know Him. Know what He says. Trust in Him. We need, some, we need preachers. We need fathers and mothers. We need grandparents. We need children one another to point us to who God is. To, that we might know Him. Because we are really, really easily able to miss out on anything of who God is. Of really knowing Him. So God reveals Himself so that we might know who He is. But God reveals Himself that we might also know what He commands. Like When we think about why does knowing God matter, we want to know if God is the one who made us, He has the authority and the power, shouldn't we want to know what He commands? We need, we need to know what God commands. So God reveals Himself that we might know that what, what He commands, and we need to know this. Okay? We'll point out why. This is eternally, this is uh, vitally significant that we know what God commands. Uh, Jesus, when He's uh, coming and declaring His ministry, He's repeatedly saying that His authority is from the Father. Jesus, uh, John 5, 19, 27, that He was doing the Father's will. Jesus is really clear. I'm not doing just my own thing. I'm doing what the Father wants. In John 6, 38, that He was sent by the Father. In John 6, 57, and chapter 7, and that He was doing and speaking what His Father desired. He keeps saying this over and over again. Jesus is wanting those who are listening to Him to know that He's not just doing His own thing. He's doing what the Father 
has called him to do. He's revealing the Father, the knowledge of what God wants to those who will listen. But then he'd also turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. I'd like to just quickly summarize this chapter. This is Matthew chapter 5 is the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, which is one of Jesus' well-known sermons, uh, 5, 6, and 7. And he's kind of laying out what God is doing uh, through him and the type of, of person that God is calling and forming to be a part of God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And he's kind of uh, talking about this law. So we need God reveals himself so that we might know what he commands and he has revealed what he commands in the law that he's given through Moses. And so there was Jesus is teaching on this law in Matthew chapter 5. He says in verse 17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill them. So Jesus is going to be teaching about the law, what it means, what God's law is, and what does it mean to keep God's law. Did, I didn't come to abolish these things. I'm here to fulfill these things. And then he says in verse 20, uh, For I say, this is your part. You need to listen what the law means for you. Uh, I say that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a good thing to know. If my righteousness is not uh, something even beyond uh, that of the religious leaders who are very, very conscientious about keeping the law, then I'm, 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 not, I'm in trouble. And then he goes and starts explaining this law. Law of murder. You have heard it said in verse 21. Uh, you shall not commit a murder. And then he goes on to strengthen the law. Like, it's not just good enough for you to say, I haven't killed anybody. When you say in your heart to your brother, you fool, you good for nothing, you idiot, you have violated God's command. It's not good enough for you. To, the law says you shall not commit adultery. Jesus is saying it's not good enough that you just have not uh, been unfaithful outside of your marriage. He said, the way that you think in your heart to lust or desire after another person, you have violated the law. And he keeps going through all the laws. And when we are tempted to say, hey, I think I got that. I've never killed anybody. I'm all right with that. He keeps blowing that away. I'm like, man, if this is what the, keeping the law is. I'm in trouble. I don't do those things. I, 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 I see that I don't keep the law in this way. And then he gets to the end uh, uh, of this section in verse uh, uh, talks about the love of neighbor, uh, loving our neighbors in verse uh, 43, and that he calls us beyond that to love even those who hate us and persecute us. Like that doesn't happen naturally. But then he goes on to verse 48. He kind of sums it up here. This whole section of explain, explaining the law. Therefore, here's what God wants. You want to know what God commands? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay. There it is. Now, this is explained a lot of ways to try to, I think, get us off the hook. That What Jesus is talking about is he's calling you to be mature. Like, there's nobody that's perfect, all right? So he's calling you to be mature and complete in your spiritual life. Okay? Yes, that is true. But he's calling you to be perfect. That's what the law requires. It's calling you to be perfect. So here's the tr problem with knowing God so that we know what he commands is that we cannot keep what he commands. All right? And if you do not keep what God commands, this is what God's word says. Galatians 3.10, quoting from Deuteronomy 27.26, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things, all things written in the book of the law to perform them. You understand? Everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, you're cursed. Cursed. Condemned. All right? Uh, Mark already quoted earlier, James uh, uh, 2.10, everybody for whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point, one point, you keep 99% of the law, great, stumble in one point, you're guilty of all of it. And then Romans 3.20, if this wasn't already clear to us, by works of the law, no flesh will be justified. 
in God's sight. It's not going to happen. I asked somebody once why they go to church. And their response was, uh, to know what God commands so I can know how to live right. Yes, that is good. It's good for us that we would know what God commands, how to live right. But we need to know something more than that. Because if we know what God commands, and we know our hearts well enough, we know that we don't keep what God commands. So we know there's more to it than that. And so God reveals himself that we might know or might receive his redemption. We need to know how to receive God's redemption, his salvation. We need to know God. He's revealed himself so that we can know and receive his redemption. And so uh, the young, wealthy man who